Good evening and welcome to the 31st Annual Historic Preservation Awards. My name is Ed Gruber. I'm a longtime member of the MHA Board of Trustees. And at this time, I'd like to welcome our brand new board chair, who was newly minted, who was just elected six days ago, Selma the Cash Hall. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, and thank you all for joining us at the 31st Annual HPA Award Ceremony. It's wonderful to see all of you here back at St. Anselm's, and there are such a wonderful host venue for us. I know that I, as I um, circulated and spoke with many of you, you were all saying the same thing. So we are just delighted to be able to host you here, and we thank you for coming. And as Mr. Bruder said, um, I, I've barely been president, so I'm not sure that I can take credit for anything. I know I can't take credit for anything here, except to say that I am honored and delighted to be here and to um, hold this role in a community that has been good to me. So um, I can say thank you to all of those people who did actually do things this, this year and foremost among them is our immediate past chair, Colleen Kurlansky. She was... <laughs> she was chair for four years, and in fact, the only chair that I knew, and she honestly did an amazing job. Um, as you recall, those were the years of the pandemic, um, shifts in leadership, uh, financial global crises, and yet she had a steady hand and ruled with clarity and intelligence and generosity. She had her, her finger on the pulse of all things Manchester, and thus she was really able to steer us very well uh, to this point. There are big shoes to fill. I'm not sure that I'll be able to do so, but I do count on her, on her help. So thank you again, Colleen. Also, um, the, this event today, um, as I said, has just been marvelous. And we have two women of our board to thank for that, Laura Gamash and Sue Gelinas, who have spent hours, um, and they've done everything except for cooking the food. Uh, but anything that looked pretty. I'd also like to thank the members of the Board of Trustees. They have been um, amazing in their commitment to this organization. Um, so not only the, the current Board of Trustees, but I've seen here many past members. So would you all please rise so that we can acknowledge your contribution and your dedication to Manchester and the Historic Association. Please rise, past and present. Certainly the board attends meetings and committee meetings and does all of that, but the work of the organization is handled by a very small but absolutely wonderful staff. And the work that they do each day, every day, is absolutely amazing. Uh, if you've been to the research center, you know how immaculate our collections are kept. And that is due um, largely to Dan Peters, our archivist. Dan has done beautiful work for years and is now going to be transitioning to another role and we hope that uh, he will be as happy there as we have been to have him. He's been ably um, assisted at the research center by Mark Mastro Marino. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the work that you do. At the Milliard Museum, this wonderful little place in the Milliard. Uh, we have a cadre of volunteers, and you saw many of them here tonight, always greeting with, with joy and absolutely delighted to help in any way that they can. So we thank them immensely, as well as Beverly Peters, who is the Visitor Services Associate, 
and Beverly up there, thank you. Um, and also uh, Bill Clayton, who manages to keep some very old buildings very nicely um, cleaned and um, well kept. So thank you all for that. Um, if you've seen a woman uh, in a gorgeous dress with a smile on her face running around everywhere today, you have seen our Director of Education, Christy Ellsworth. What she does every day surpasses education. It is everything and anything that anyone asks of her. But the, the hallmark of her presence is her, her overall joie de vivre. She is just um, ebullient and upbeat and has a can-do attitude. That coupled with her uh, expertise in um, art and her ability, which is phenomenal, of working with fourth graders and all of those young kids is just absolutely amazing. So we thank Christy, who, by the way, is a graduate of Central High School and a former student of mine. So let's come back. And finally, um, Jeff Barakloff, our executive director. Jeff has been with the organization for over 11 years, although he did take what I call a sabbatical, um, where he further honed his many outstanding skills and has come back to us. And again, I'm sure you have seen all of the wonderful work he has done in exhibits and in just managing all of us. Um, but yet he does it uh, with intelligence, with overall, I would say, the calmness of his demeanor in all situations is amazing. So we thank him and um, hope his tenure lasts triple 11 years. Thank you. <laughs> Manchester has a rich history, and the MHA showcases that. From a small village settlement on the banks of the Merrimack to the Queen City today, Manchester has been a haven for so many. Here, immigrants have thrived. They came looking for a place that they could set down roots, a place where they can work and raise a family. And they did so in the mills, in the factories, in construction sites, everywhere. As time went on, others came to this community as well. Technology, a higher ed. Manchester is a thriving place. But there's more to Manchester than just that. There is a sense of community here, and it's that on which the Manchester Historic Association builds. My husband, who is not a native, calls Manchester the biggest small town anywhere. And I think you know what I mean by that. You can go to the Puritan, you're gonna know everybody. You can go to the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, and you're going to meet someone from Manchester. It, it, actually, it did happen to me. <laughs> but that's who we are. A famous person once said that a people who have no knowledge of their history, their origin, their culture, are like a tree without roots. Well, I think we all know that Manchester abounds in trees. But those trees have to be cultivated. And so it's incumbent upon all of us, each of us individually and all of us collectively, to invest in this community, to invest in the Manchester Historic Association, which is a steward of all of this. And tonight's HPAs, we are delighted to be highlighting all the good that is in Manchester. But the HPAs are simply a microcosm of all that we represent. We're honoring institutions, businesses, individuals who have invested in this community, who have learned from the past, brought it into the present so that it can endure into the future. That's what we're about. We thank you for your support. We thank you for your generosity. 
We thank you for your commitment, not just to Manchester, but to the Manchester Historic Association as well, allowing us to continue with our mission to collect, preserve, and share all that is good in Manchester. Thank you. But West is going to have its time here, too. That's only fair. Um, but if we're going to say anything, the people from West have a history at Central as well. So, and that's what Manchester is all about. We are all part of this fabric, each fiber, that enhances our community. And now it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce our honorary chair, although she probably needs no introduction, um, Clara Monier. Clara. <laughs> Clara was raised in Bedford and currently resides in Goffstown. She earned a master's degree in urban planning and geography at St. A's as, and has been active in her greater community for most of her life serving on the state and national levels. She's the former executive director of New Hampshire Housing, having also served as the director of Region 1 of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. She is a 2021 recipient of the Business and Industry Association's Lifetime Achievement Award and is currently a board member of Amiskeg Industries. And this is only a glimpse into, into her very extraordinary life of community service. But there is also one other element of her CV that we're most proud of today, and that is that she is a former member of the Board of Trustees of the Manchester Historic Association. We come full circle here in Manchester. Join me, please, in welcoming Clara Monier. Thank you, Selma, for a very kind introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to support the Manchester Historic Association here this evening. Manchester has always been a city in transition. Manchester was a mill town and look where it is now. It is now transitioning into a college town with over 14 institutions of higher learning and a major center of biotechnology innovations. We have gone from computer games to replacements of arms, legs, and other assorted body, part, body parts. Those who know, who knows what those little black boxes on wheels rolling through the mill yard would be capable of doing. We have come a long way in a very few short years. We should not forget how we got to the future. That is one of the major reasons for the existence of the Manchester Historic Association. So thank you all for what you do for the association. Our descendants, all of them, have to know where we came from and how far we have moved. Manchester is in the process of adjusting and recognizing this. But we must remember what we have done to get to the future. The Manchester Historic Association should play an important role in those efforts. And with your help, it will. I thank you for being here this evening, and a very big thank you for a special evening. Thank you. Well, every organization has a person at the top 
top and keeps all the plates spinning. And from the Manchester Historic Association, that person is our executive director. And it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Jeff Barraclough. Thank you, Ed. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the 31st Annual Historic Preservation Awards. <clears throat> for 31 years now, through this awards program, the Manchester Historic Association has been recognizing and supporting the efforts of more than 200 individuals, businesses, and organizations who have made significant contributions to the preservation of buildings, neighborhoods, traditions, and other historic resources in our city. The first time I attended this event, it was the 19th annual, and I know some of you have been here from the very beginning. So I'd like to take a few minutes now to talk about why we do this, why we recognize historic preservation in Manchester, and why we've been doing it now for 31 years. One of our sponsors, Matazuski Architects, included the following quote by John C. Sawhill in their advertisement that you will find in tonight's program book. He said, quote, in the end, our society will be defined not only by what we create, but by what we refuse to destroy. In the last 31 years, there has been a lot of important historic structures that the people of Manchester have refused to destroy. 15 years ago, in 2008, the MHA included a list of endangered historic buildings in their program book for the Preservation Awards that year. Included in this list were many landmarks that have since been preserved or restored and have received preservation awards. These include the Ash Street School, the Pandora Mill Building, Manchester's first high school on Lowell Street, St. Anne's Church, and the Weston Observatory. We at the MHA certainly do not take credit for the work that this was done. This was done by conscientious property owners and city leaders who cared about preser preserving the history of those who have come before us. But we do hope that the Historic Preservation Awards program has encouraged preservation efforts by demonstrating that historic preservation is possible, whether you are a homeowner, a small business, a nonprofit, or a department within the city, and that historic preservation is good for the community. Another longtime sponsor and supporter of this event, Dick Antignost, said at this event a couple of years ago when he spoke that the Manchester Historic Association and the Preservation Awards has helped to make historic preservation fashionable by bringing projects to the forefront for everyone to appreciate. So I would like to thank you all for your support, whether you are new to this event or have been supporting the event for 31 years. Thank you for helping this worthwhile cause to preserve our heritage. Before we go any further in the night's program, we do have some wonderful sponsors who have made this evening possible. I'd like to recognize our lead sponsor for tonight, RBC Wealth Management, the Belanger Wealth Management Group, for your continued support of both the MHA and of the Historic Preservation Awards, and also to St. Mary's Bank and to Eastern Bank, our $2,500 level award sponsors. I would encourage you all to please be sure to see, uh, look through your program book, this this evening for a complete list of all of our sponsors. Thank you to all of you and to the many individuals who also came and bought tickets and supported this event. Um, I would like to also just acknowledge and thank our Board of Trustees and the event committee, including co-chairs Laura Gamash and Suja Linus, who have worked tirelessly to make this event a success. Thank you also to our Historic Preservation Committee, who met last fall to consider award nominations and choose tonight's honorees. Thank you to the many volunteers who have made what we do possible. And finally, a, a special recognition to our hardworking and dedicated staff. Uh, if you could please stand and wave when I call your name if you're here. Christy Ellsworth, our Director of Education. Beverly, <laughs> Beverly Peters, Visitor Services Associate. Bill Clayton, our maintenance coordinator. Mark Mastermarino, our library assistant. And finally, Daniel Peters, our archivist. And as some are also already mentioned, I do want to make special mention of Dan tonight. After nearly 10 years working at the MHA in a variety of roles, he'll be moving on at the end of the week and taking a new job. So thank you, Dan for all that you have done for the MHA, and we wish you all the best in your new endeavors. So 
the mission of the Manchester Historic Association is to collect, preserve, and share the history of Manchester. So I'd like to take a few minutes now to share some of the highlights of the past year to show some of the ways that we have been doing just that. In 2022, we were finally able to welcome school field trips back to the Milliard Museum following the pandemic. We had more than 1,400 children visit the Milliard Museum last year and are expecting, by the end of this year, more than 2,000. Not counting the pandemic, over the past five years, we have actually doubled the number of school children who visit the museum. And not only are we seeing more children, but we are updating and offering new program options for them. These options include new scholarly scavenger hunts, a Children of the Mills program, where kids learn about child labor and what life was like for mill workers, and new hands-on activities, where kids take part in exercises such as weaving, archaeological digs, and city planning. We have also partnered with several youth-serving nonprofits in the city to supplement their programming, including Girls at Work, the Girl Scouts, the Manchester Police Athletic League, and we partnered with the Sea Science Center to conduct a series of oral history interviews with 20 different people representing a variety of STEM disciplines, from software to high-tech engineering, all in Manchester. And this is something that we feel will serve as an important, uh, an important record for Manchester industry um, at this time in our history. We've also partnered with local colleges, including St. Anselm, for our first-generation freshman programs. And we continue to reach and engage with new audiences through our social media campaigns, including profiles of prominent women during Women's History Month in March. Beyond educational programs, we continue to offer new things to see at the Milliard Museum, and have seen an increase in over 2,000 more visitors to the museum compared with last year. At the museum, we continue to offer rotating temporary exhibitions that focus on a particular topic or artist, this past winter, we produced an exhibition highlighting the photography of Frank Kelly, a prominent Manchester photographer from the mid-20th century. And our current exhibition that opened just a month ago showcases the works of the artist Henry W. Herrick. Herrick was a talented wood engraver, book illustrator, and watercolorist from Manchester in the 1800s, as well as a poet and a historian. And this exhibit takes advantage of the extensive collection of artwork and paintings that the MHA owns that are by Herrick and features many of his works from throughout his long and illustrious career. <coughs> Speaking of our collection, we are continuing to update the permanent exhibit at the Milliard Museum that chronologically tells the story of both Manchester and the Emmeskeg Mills. A few recent highlights include the neon Pandora sweater sign that was installed in the museum, as well as two long-term loans, a John Stark statue by the sculptor John Rogers, and a model of the mill yard that was done by the Manchester Housing Authority in 1967, just prior to urban renewal when some of the mill buildings were taken down. Our collection is continuing to grow and be well cared for at the MHA Research Center. Each year, we take in dozens of new donations of historical objects that enhance our collection. Each object we have helps to tell the story of Manchester and Manchester's people. And every new item that we accept helps us to expand that story and to more completely preserve the city's history. If the object is not on exhibit at the Milliard Museum, it is stored in our archives and cared for at our research center on Amherst Street, our headquarters building since 1931, and where dozens of people come each month to research and learn about the family, their property, or other topics of interest. And we continue to conserve and preserve important artifacts already in our collection, like this leather-bound presentation Bible from 1856 that was signed by members of the Piscataquag Church Sunday School in Manchester with conservation work done to both the pages and the binding. We also launched a new website at the end of last year. The site has a fresh look and is mobile responsive. And from that site, you can access our online database where volunteers have spent countless hours digitizing and uploading historical photographs and other materials from the MHA's collections. We also offer a number of walking tours, lectures, and other public programs throughout the year. These include our popular actor-led tours partnering with the Majestic Theatre, including our Best of Amoskeg event that was held just this past March at the Milliard Museum, a walking tour of Manchester's West Side, talks about local historical topics, and our popular American Girl doll tea parties. 
And speaking of the tea parties, let me just take a moment to recognize my colleague, our Director of Education, Christy Ellsworth, who received the prestigious Excellence Award for this year from the New England Museum Association, for, in part for her work at the tea party. We have several events and programs planned throughout the summer and fall this year, and without the support of all of our members, our sponsors, and other donors, none of this would be possible. So again, thank you very much. Well, this is the part of the program which we call the ASP, and as you probably know, we receive no city, state, or federal funding. So we depend upon supporters like you to fulfill our various missions. That is to collect, preserve, and share the history of our great community. We hope that tonight you will consider making a donation to help support the many ways that the MHA helps this community by preserving its history. If you do choose to raise your hand tonight to make a pledge, we have board members who are stationed throughout the room who will be handing out stars. Please keep your hand in the air as they can hand you a star with a corresponding amount, which will enable us to help process your pledge most efficiently after the program. So to begin, let's start at the $1,000 level. As an example of what your donation of $1,000 could do, you could help subsidize a new exhibition at the Milliard Museum, such as ones we just saw photos of, our, our current exhibit on the works of Manchester artist Henry Herrick, or our previous exhibit with the photography of Frank Kelly. Would anyone tonight be interested in pledging at the $1,000 level? I see a hand in the second part of the crowd, right front of the yes. Mr. Dreyer, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you very much. All right. So Dick would not like to sit in the boat all alone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. And, and Michael, Michael Duffy, Duffy down in the front as well. Thank you. Michael. Nancy Mackish, thank you. I Yvette in the front, thank you so much. Are there others at the $500 level? I see Shannon is right here giving out stars. If then we haven't explained the stars, uh, we will in a minute how they work, but uh, hang out of those till the end of the evening, and that's how we'll redeem all these, these wonderful pledges. Anyone else for the $500 level? I see a hand back here, coming up a level. Thank you. <coughs> of course, there's nothing stopping you from coming up to any of us after the program is over if you'd like to make your donation in a more confidential way. We appreciate that, too. Yeah? Well, we should take a moment here to point out that all of those who have made pledges so far will receive a great gift bag that Ed is modeling. This gift bag is filled with some wonderful items, including gift cards to Cafe Lorraine, Fratello's Italian Grill, T-Bones, and Stark Brewery, as well as a beautiful print of the Manchester Mill Yard by Gene Talman. 
The gift bag also includes a bottle of wine, and those wine bottles are currently over at Davison Hall as the centerpieces on the tables. So if you pick up your gift bag tonight, be sure to also go back to Davison Hall where we will have dessert and grab one of those wine bottles. There are some other items in the bag as well, in total a value of over $150. And so these gift bags will also go to anyone who will pledge at the $250 level. Anyone? And we have a limit of 30 of these available. Yes, right? yes. So, if anybody would like to raise your hand on the $250 level to get these exclusive gift bags, I'm seeing lots of hands right here. In fact, you have one right in front of you, Judy. We'll wait just a moment for our volunteers and members of the trustees to get out there with the stars. And just a correction to what I just said the wine bottles have actually been relocated over to here, so you don't have to go far to get your wine. Anybody else that we want to sing that we can't see here? Again, if you'd like to make a donation, we miss you here, see us at the end of the program. But thank you all for your generosity. Um, we will make these gift bags available to you at the end of tonight's program. You can leave with them. Let's move along now to the $100 level. A gift of $100 would help support the operations of our MHA Research Center on Amherst Street. Uh, each year we receive lots and lots, hundreds probably, of donations of photographs, historical objects, papers related to the city of Manchester. And all of these need to be cataloged and stored properly and accessioned so that we can tell where they came from and what they pertain to. Uh, we also digitize items and make them accessible through our online database. And it's something of a, of a joke that we talk about how we need acid-free boxes to store a lot of this paperwork in so that they don't degrade over the years. So a $100 donation would help us buy these expensive but specialized acid-free boxes. So do we have somebody that would like to, I see a hand up front here for the $100. I see another hand, I see a bunch of hands, that's great. Thank you all very much, we really appreciate that. Make those trustees run. <laughs> Any others at the $100 level before we move on? All right. all right. Thank you all very much. The final set of stars that our trustees have tonight is the $50 level. Would anyone be interested in pledging at $50? Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, keep your hands in the ear until our trustees can hand you out the appropriate star. You may notice if you receive a star that it has a QR code on the back. If you wish, you can scan that code to make a secure payment online. Otherwise, staff will be happy to uh, assist you at our registration table just outside here following tonight's program. So on, on behalf of all of our members, thank you so much for your support and your generosity. Thank you. All these awards Century Club because they are exclusively for organizations, individuals, and uh, causes which have reached that 100th anniversary, that important milestone. So the first Century Club award that we are awarding tonight goes to Manchester High School West, which has a series of events coming up over the next few weeks, including a back-to-school social June 1st and a museum gala on June 17th. Please welcome Principal Richard Deshaun.
Lions Club, the local chapter of the Lions Club International, the world's largest community service organization. The Manchester Club was chartered on June 15, 1923, making it the oldest Lions Club in New Hampshire. Here to accept the award are Jean Lemire and Dick St. Jean. Projects of their own. 
They turned a small kitchen into a bigger one by removing a wall and creating a sunken family room. They also removed an upstairs wall to make a master bedroom and bath, complete with jacuzzi, and converted an upstairs closet into a second bathroom. They have beautifully maintained the property by painting when necessary, installing new windows, and a new roof. Let's take a moment to enjoy the house as it exists today. The Murphys are passionate about the gardens and even discovered a bit of a mystery when they moved in. They found the gravestone of 15 year old Elizabeth Rowell in the basement. She died in 1840 when Manchester was barely incorporated as a town. There was no municipal burying ground then, so Elizabeth was interred on the family farm. She was moved to Pine Grove Cemetery with other family members in 1879, but her original grave marker remains on North River Road as a fascinating conversation piece. <laughs> the Manchester Historic Association is proud to present this homeowner's award to Michael and Lynn Murphy for their home at 1053 River Road. Someone told me I had two minutes and Ed one minute, so I'm going to go probably in between. Um, most of the history of the house has been chronicled. You know, we, we feel like we are there now, but we kind of hold on to the, it for another generation. It's been only eight families in 200 years. In fact, 200 years ago this year, uh, General John Stock died, rather amazingly, at 92 years old. But he had given this land to his uh, grandson 10 years prior to that in 1810. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention a couple of people who have been very important in helping us maintain and keep, keep the house as it is. First off, Mark Shackelford, who is our painter, who did such an amazing job on the exterior. Uh, we took a little bit of a leap of faith, uh, going with a little more bold color scheme. <laughs> After he first put on one coat, I thought Lynn was going to be up on the widow's walk. <laughs> but he said, no, no, wait for the second coat, wait for it to dry, and sure enough, it, it ended up being, as I thought, beautiful. Secondly, um, Stanton Landscaping does all the heavy lifting in our gardens. We do all the fun stuff. They do all the heavier cleanup. Um, and we had an awful lot of old, even though 1940 uh, the Freibergs redid things, we still had a lot of antique wiring, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, Dick Wimet is an electrician who did extensive work rewiring the house and modernizing it. So, uh, and, the, and last but not least, uh, Cindy and Rick McLaughlin from Upstairs Downstairs have been instrumental in choosing color schemes, both inside, outside, wall coverings, etc. cetera. And she's been pretty indispensable. So. Thank you all very much. Uh, we really appreciate this. For our next award, we moved downtown to an area once known as Park Street, but today is known as 163 Lake Avenue. We're focusing on a brick building that looks like it might have been an old fire station. Actually, it was built in 1894 for use as the Ward 5 voting room and the home for a famous local militia. It is also inextricably tied to the sad tale of William H. Durbin. In the days after the war between the states, towns raised their own militias. There were several in Manchester, and they each had an armory where they could store their equipment, their uniforms, their supplies, and hold social gatherings. Well, the Sheraton Guards were organized in Manchester in August 1865 under the direction of Reverend William McDonald, pastor of St. Anne's Roman Catholic Church, which had twice been attacked by Protestant mobs in the previous year. So the unit was actually named for the famous Army Major General Philip A. Sheridan, who had served with many of the Manchester men involved in the Civil War. 
Initially called the Sheridan Rifles, they joined the state militia as its only Irish unit, Company B, 1st Regiment, New Hampshire's National Guard. With 110 initial members, the Sheridan Guard needed a place to meet. On March 22, 1867, the Amescape Manufacturing Company sold the city of Manchester a 3,000 square foot parcel on Park Street. The lot sat empty until January 1893, when the Board of Mayor and authorized the princely sum of $6,000 to erect the building. In 1894, the city records show that the Sheridan Guards occupied that building on the renamed Lake Avenue, rent free, but it noted that Ward 5 meetings were also held there. A grand opening of the Sheridan Guard Armory was held January 15, 1895, with a public reception, live dance music, and refreshments. Well, America went to war against Spain in Cuba in 1898, and the Sheridan Guards were the first in the state of New Hampshire to volunteer for federalization. One of their members signing the petition was 22-year-old William H. Durbin. And note the spelling of his name, D-E-R-V-I-N. In the ensuing years, it would frequently be misspelled D-E-R-W-I-N. The Sheridans, in fact, never made it to Cuba, but they were assigned to a fever-stricken camp, Camp Thomas, in Chickamauga Park, Georgia. The weather was foul. Young Corporal Durbin caught typhoid fever, then slept for two nights in a tent without any side flaps, during which he contracted pneumonia and died. Durbin's body lay in state in the Ward 5 Armory back in Manchester, which was draped in black for the occasion. The funeral procession stepped off towards St. Joseph Cathedral, where a military funeral with high honors was conducted August 16th of 1898. Durbin was buried in the family plot at St. Joseph Cemetery, where there is a small monument to him, noting he was the first local boy to die in the Spanish-American War, and note that even on his own plaque, his name is spelled both ways. Well, in 1910, 12,000 Manchester citizens turned out as the Sheridan Guard laid the cornerstone for an outdoor memorial at the old St. Joseph Cemetery on Donald Street. The structure sheltered an altar and a dome supported by eight nine-foot columns, allowing mass to be celebrated from any of the open sides. Like later American Legion posts, which were named for fallen local veterans, the United Spanish War Veterans named their Manchester unit the William H. Durbin Camp No. 5. By 1904, the city of Manchester recorded the cost of repairing and maintaining this Ward 5 Sheridan Guard Armory at $77.61 a year. The Sheridan Guard finally disbanded in 1939, so the building was utilized primarily as the Ward 5 voting place and a community meeting program, a community program room. One final reunion and one final dinner for members was held in the Lake Ar uh, Armory, the Lake Avenue Armory, in 1940 on the 75th anniversary of the Sheridan Guard's founding. By the mid-1960s, this building was vacant and becoming an eyesore. In 1969, it was turned over to the Manchester Community Action Program for $150 per month rent, providing that the facility be vacated by 11 p.m. to spare residential neighbors any noise. Well, after more years of vacancy in the early 1970s, the Board of Mayor and Alderman leased the property to Nicholas D. Burgess, doing business as the North American Veterans Association. Essentially, it became a social club, and many observers criticized the noise and the general seediness of the neighborhood. In 2005, Linda and Peter Murphy bought the building for $120,000 and immediately envisioned an entirely different use. Murphy's bare knuckle boxing had already been in business for 25 years, offering lessons in pugilistics, kickboxing, mixed martial arts, and self-defense, as well as circus arts and dance instruction for children. Today, the interior of the building is dominated by a boxing ring. Large windows offer plenty of natural daylight. False ceilings have been removed, exposing the original heavy beam roof supports. The exterior of the brick building is much as it appeared in 1894, with the exception of some replacement front doors. The interior has been stripped back to the original brick walls by removing decades worth of flooring, sheetrock, plaster, and false ceilings. Linda Murphy has gone to considerable effort and expense to bring the building up to current code with new electrical and air circulation systems. Unfortunately, in recent years, the next door property was sold and the building was built extremely close to the Murphy facility, effectively blocking out all sunlight on the east side of the building. Perhaps you remember this piece on WNUR-TV's Chronicle back in 2015. Incidentally, Aaron really beat up on the show. Murphy's, like the rest of the world, suffered a hit when coronavirus came along. 
The gym had to temporarily close, but is back in action with a full program. The building of 163 Lake Avenue has been a military armory, a voting place, a nonprofit organization, a nightclub, and today is a supervised gymnasium and instructional facility. The Manchester Historic Association is pleased to present an adaptive reuse award to Linda Murphy of Murphy's Bare Knuckle Boxing for the building at 163 Lake Avenue. My building sat empty for 12 years and nobody wanted to buy it. And after having to move three times uh, with my business, I thought I'm going to try to buy something and be able to stay there, make some noise, have nice flat floors and high ceilings. And so I um, happened to see this building and it looked very dark and just something nobody would notice when, when you drive by. And because the, the front of it was covered, it had spray paint on the brick, and it, it just looked bad. So prior to that, it was, uh, I heard from the neighbors, the worst bar in the city. <laughs> so, and, and it has got a neighborhood that hangs out with each other, and they would come in and tell me stories about how their shoes got stuck in the grenadine. And <laughs> so it was just interesting and, uh, fixing it up and getting to meet some of the people that came by. And um, I thought I'm gonna put glass in the front and put flowers in the front and make it nice. And people thought I was crazy. And I said, no, if we make it nice, uh, people will respect it and that's been the case. And as an artist, I needed something that uh, we could operate and have, have um, the students that come in to learn feel as though they can think and, and create. And so this old large space works very well for that. Uh, it looks like an armory. It has the strength of an armory. It has the feeling of a church. And it feels like a home. And uh, a big um, goal of ours is to empower people and have them feel comfortable and have them have a safe space. And so we've just got a heavyweight title um, for <laughs> King of the Ring, which is New England, New York, beyond. Uh, first one in his family that went to college, he won the heavyweight title Saturday night graduated from SNHU Sunday morning. Uh, we got a 165 pounder elite boxer that came in second in King of the Ring. Um, in the circus arts, my daughter who's with me performs beautifully. She did a, a TEDx. Um, they're now being asked to do a fashion show in New York City. So we have a lot to practice and create because that needs to be on point for New York City. Um, but lots of kids and very fun adults good feng shui in this building. And so I'm so grateful to get this award because I've been in the grind for years and to have somebody uh, come up and say they appreciate the work that we're doing there is really nice. And so I'm glad to have taken this old building and given it a new life. Uh, we're gonna do a second phase as we're coming out of COVID and get it fixed up a little nicer. So maybe you can all come by for a party sometime. <laughs> We have uh, our last one, chess boxing, which is really cool. Um, they do a round of boxing, a round of chess, round of boxing, round of chess. And then we do some flying on the trapeze in between, and you cannot get bored. It's really fun. So just be watching for that. And thank you again very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
strife in America. Manchester was a young city in 1860 with a population of only 20,000 people. The entire state of New Hampshire only had 326,000 residents. The war that took place between 1861 and 1865 has been called the War of Rebellion, the Great Rebellion, the War Between the States, the War of Secession, and the Confederate term, War for Southern Independence. Northern writers refer to it as a civil war because of their belief that individual states had no right to secede from the Union. Southern writers labeled it the war between the Confederate States of America and the United States of America. At its simplest, Northern states opposed slavery and Southern states favored it. Both sides resented the other, telling it how to live. On April 15, 1861, President Abraham Lincoln issued a call for 75,000 men to suppress the Southern Rebellion. In the next two weeks, more than 2,000 New Hampshire men answered the call. Figures vary about exactly how many Granite Staters fought in the Civil War, but it was believed to be about 34,000 men. The six New England states provided about 14% of the Union or the Northern Army. In all, Manchester sent 2,687 men to the Civil War. 86 of them were killed outright, 59 more died later from their injuries, 188 succumbed to disease, and more than 400 were mortally wounded. Many locals did their part in the war effort, including noted artist Henry Herrick. His ink-washed print of soldiers and their cannon is in our MHA collection, and of course it's just part of the special exhibit of Herrick's work that opened in the New York Museum last month. City leaders began serious talk about building a soldier's monument in June of 1877. One issue was finding the necessary funding, but there was also serious debate about the location. It was originally planned for Tremont Park, bordered by Bridge, High, Pine, and Union Streets. Of course, today that area is known as Pulaski Park, or a whole different military monument was built in 1938. By March of 1878, Manchester officials decided to locate the Soldiers' Monument on the northwest corner of Merrimack Square, a nearly six-acre plot that the Amesgate Company sold to the city for one dollar, bounded by Central, Elm, Merrimack, and Chestnut Streets. Clearer thinkers suggested moving the monument to the center of Merrimack Square, which then became known as Merrimack Common. Today, of course, it is known as Veterans Park, and this monument is one of the most photographed scenes in the city. It was designed by architect George Keller of Hartford, Connecticut. He actually drew the plans for a Civil War monument for Buffalo, New York, but when they disagreed on whether or not a fountain should be included, Keller offered the concept to Manchester. Alderman here authorized an expense not to exceed $22,000. The firm of Frederick and Felt of Quincy, Mass., was hired to build it, and a dedication ceremony was held September 11, 1879. The cornerstone was laid the following May 30th. The center column of New Hampshire granite rises to a height of 50 feet from a circular pedestal. Atop it stands Victory, a bronze crowned female with a wreath in one hand and a sword in the other by sculptor Caspar Gubel. Around the base are four bronze figures, the artillerymen, the cavalrymen, the infantrymen, and the sailor. All five bronze figures were cast at the National Fine Arts Foundry. Between the four statues around the base are eight bronze posts in pairs for gas lights. Surrounding the pedestal is a continuous four-foot frieze in bas relief depicting wartime scenes. Attached to the corners of the circular pedestal are a dozen gargoyles from which jets of water fell into a 30-foot basin. A plaque at the base of the monument reads, in honor of the men of Manchester who gave their services in the war, which preserved the union of the states and secured equal rights to all under the Constitution. This monument is built by a grateful city. Well, of course, today Merrimack Common is slightly smaller than it was originally because the eastern portion of the block was taken to build the Hillsborough County Superior Courthouse. In recent years, the city has erected a massive seasonal tent that covers a performing arts stage. It serves a purpose, but it does tend to dwarf the adjacent monument. As often happens with public monuments, this one was hit by the environment. It took its toll. The soldier's monument had bronze that tarnished, metal that rusted, water that stained the granite base, and vandals did damage to the basin. So in early 2020, the City Department of Highways teamed up with the Engineering Department and the Manchester Parks, Recreation, and Cemeteries Departments to renovate the monument. They cobbled together funding, which would eventually top $250,000, but they provided a grand facelift, including new drain and manhole covers, replacement ornamental lights, cleaning and repointing of granite, 
removing clay brick and installing concrete pavers in the basin, cleaning and treating the bronze figures, installing a dozen new uplights, replacing missing swords, and replacing opaque light fixtures with clear glass. It was a lot of work, it took a lot of time, but the project is now complete. In fact, the water fountain was just turned on during a ribbon cutting on April 20th. Tonight we are pleased to present this restoration of a city landmark award to the city of Manchester for the Civil War Monument at Veterans Park. Accepting the award is Mark Gomez, Chief of the Park's Recreation and Cemetery Division. Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Manchester Historic Association, for this award. I get the honor of accepting it um, and wearing the flower, but the truth is the, the project was an enormous team effort involving several key personnel, not only from Parks and Rec, but also other divisions within the Department of Public Works, other departments across the city, private contractors whose expertise was indispensable. Um, none of it would have been possible, of course, without the recognition from the Board of Mayor and Aldermen that preserving this wonderful monument was a worthwhile use of taxpayer money. The phrase team effort is sometimes thrown around too readily, I think, but this really was one, and I want to take a few moments to recognize all those who were involved. Restoration work began with detailed scoping and scheduling done by two highway division engineers, Casey Moran, an excellent project manager who has since moved on to a position with the state of New Hampshire, and Owen Friend Gray, who is now our uh, Deputy Public Works Director. Once field work began, associated concrete coatings repaired the crumbling fountain bowl, repointed re joints, and generally made sure the base of the monument was in working condition and looking good. I know a few folks from ACC are here tonight, so I just want to call out their names. Mark Guimont, Christine and Tom Hall, and Laura Paquette. Thank you very much for your work. <laughs> The painstaking cleaning and conservation of the bronze statues and ornamental lights was performed by Josh Crane and his team at Daedalus Conservators. Um, they also did, by the way, the monument at Pulaski Park that was honored a few years ago um, by the Manchester Historic Association. Josh was hoping to make it tonight, um, but he and his team were busy on another job south of Boston, um, so he wasn't able to, but we're very grateful for his meticulous work. And then, um, Ed, did you say that uh, the city of Buffalo rejected this design because of the inclusion of the fountain? Right. Yeah, they might have been onto something there. Uh, <laughs> once the monument was reassembled is when this really became an all-hands-on-deck sort of enterprise. Parks and Rec crews, under the direction of Kelly Coatsier and Andy Vashon, both of whom are here tonight, discovered that the valve at the street that needed to be open to feed water to the fountain was broken. So Waterworks stepped in and repaired the valve, but that led to the discovery that the old pump inside the fountain was no longer working. So Parks personnel worked to remove, repair, and reinstall the pump, but that led to the discovery by our irrigation technicians, Josh Caswell and Matt Scheid, that a new time clock needed to be wired in, which was when we brought in the facilities division electrician, Jeff Grenier, to work it all out. Anyway, that was the last piece, thankfully, uh, but the end product, I think everybody agrees, was, was well worth it. Um, if I could just say in closing real quickly, I'd, I'd like to thank the Manchester Historic Association, not for this award per se, but for all you do throughout the year to help celebrate Manchester's fascinating history, uh, the exhibits at the Milliard Museum, the local tours, the library and online catalog, which we have used uh, frequently in, in Parks and Rec. Um, so anyway, it's special to get an award from an organization such as yours. Thank you.
next award recognizes an ethical value, that is taking care of or preserving something to trust the one's care. In this case, we're talking about one of the city's oldest residential buildings. In April 1841, the Amscape Manufacturing Company donated a parcel at the corner of Chestnut and Lowell Streets to the city for use as a schoolhouse. Opened initially as the Lowell Street Grammar School in 1847, the second floor became Manchester's first high school, and later it was known as the Manual Training School. In December of 1843, the textile company sold 6,000 square feet of land in two adjoining parcels on Lowell Street to Horace Gordon for residential use, price tag 350 bucks a piece. As was typical at the time, the deed from the Anniscape limited each parcel to just one dwelling house with no on-site trade or manufacturing allowed for a period of 25 years. Well, the next month, Anniscape unburdened itself of the rest of the block by selling the parcel at Lowell and Mott Pine Streets to the brand new St. Michael's Episcopal Church. We'll come back to that in a moment. I suppose we could say that Horace Gordon was Manchester's original real estate flipper. Less than four months after buying two lots on Lowell, Gordon sold one of them to Benjamin Kinsley for $400. Two months later, Kinsley flipped part of it to Isaac M. Riddle for $150. It was Riddle who built the house that we honor tonight in 1844. And incidentally, Isaac Riddle was one of the founders of this organization. The actual address of lot number 364 is 98 Lowell Street. After Isaac's death in 1875, the property passed to his stepdaughter, Fanny, seen here in the carriage. This image was taken just up the block on Lowell Street. If the name Riddle sounds familiar, perhaps you have visited the Ursula Chapel at Pine Grove Cemetery, which Fanny built in memory of her mother. Well, Fanny Riddle remained at 98 Lowell Street until her death in 1901, a total of 57 years. There is evidence that she was using the building as a boarding house as early as 1880. This area of Lowell Street, directly across from the Hartnett parking lot, was originally part of a very fashionable neighborhood. There were several beautiful private houses on the block, and of course the high school building next door. During the 1900s, the Riddle House changed hands numerous times. Deed holders included Howard N. Bond, Betsy and George Lovejoy, Furness Underhill, Blanche Underhill James, Jenny Lacasse, Teresa J. Cody, and Edward and Evangeline Murphy. In 18, uh, 1980, the Murphy sold 98 Bowl Street to the city of Manchester, which put it for several uses, including group housing for the homeless, an emergency shelter, and even housing for cast members of the New Hampshire Performing Arts Center. In 1997, the city sold it to the successor of St. Michael's, which by now is known as Grace Episcopal Church, which has used it for the church sexton's residence, Sunday school classrooms, and its home to city year core members. The building itself is a fine example of pre-Civil War Greek Revival style, featuring panelized corner pilasters, oval oak crown molding and capitals, a heavy entablature, gable end pediments, and a classic portico. It once included a one-story kitchen L connected to a carriage house on the back street. The church undertook an extensive restoration in the late 2000s, including removing asbestos siding, rebuilding the large corner pilasters, repairing window sills, the water table, and trim, and replacing the top of the pediment shelves and the portico roof with new copper. Since then, the church property committee has replaced the big roof and done maintenance work as needed, including a painting project finished last summer. The committee may look into further grants to restore the original windows, which were lost to vinyl replacements before the church bought the house. But well, we're here about the changing neighborhood. In the late 1990s, the Manchester Institute of Arts and Sciences received a $26 million endowment from arts patron Mary Fuller Russell. It expanded into the New Hampshire Institute of Art, taking over several downtown properties, including the old high school building, which was moved several feet closer to Lowell Street to make room for a modern multi-story dormitory high-rise. However, in 2018, New England College absorbed NHIA. And just recently, the college announced it would sell most of its Manchester property and move the arts program back to Henniker starting this fall. What will happen to this dormitory remains to be seen. At the same time, developers plan to break ground any minute now on a multi-story residential building and parking garage on what is currently the Hartnett parking lot. The little house at 98 Lowell Street, now known as Grace House, will be dwarfed by the high-rise buildings surrounding it. The stewardship that we acknowledge tonight will be more important than ever. The NHA presents this stewardship award to Grace House at 98 Wall Street, and accepting the award on behalf of Grace Episcopal Church is Michael Duffy.
There's a collect that comes around on Good Friday in the Book of Common Prayer that includes these words. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see that things that were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection. It may surprise some people to know that this project has been controversial over the years among the people of Great Episcopal Church. From the beginning, it was an eyesore, a needy old building, and a very complicated real estate deal. It was seen as the only possible place to expand our landlocked campus next door and to provide Sunday school space in the days of 100 kids in the congregation. I can imagine a lot of heated meetings of rectors and wardens, of vestries and property committees over the return on investment, the cost, the value, the usefulness. The rectors probably wondered what it had to do with God. The vestries wondered how they'd pay for it. And the property committees were already overwhelmed with the 150-year-old pile of granite slate and stained glass right next door. A church secretary thought it would be a perfect place for a parking lot. The treasurer kept threatening to get out the for sale sign. An arrogant but enthusiastic church sexton tried to live into his Portsmouth delusions of grandeur by pulling off bits of asbestos siding to find splendid Greek Revival corner pilasters and pediments. A sympathetic rector made sure he didn't get fired for it. And enough of the congregation and enough of the rectors and wardens and vestries decided to take a chance on a crappy old house stranded in a downtown neighborhood. And enough property committees decided to take good care of it. And enough treasurers decided to invest in it. That an interesting thing happened. The place has become a three-dimensional illustration of some of the things we hear about next door in church. It has welcomed the stranger when it provided shelter for a refugee family from the Sudan. It has faithfully demonstrated, as it has gone from eyesore to landmark, the hope of new life in the midst of death and decay. And we all know that good church is good theater. Grace House served as home to generations of young actors in town to perform at the palace. Tonight we give thanks to all those parishioners all those rectors, wardens, property committee volunteers, and staff members over all these years and to the MHA for recognizing and honoring their good stewardship. By the way, another thing we like to talk about next door. Finally, finally, I'd like to invite everyone to enjoy our beautiful and historic buildings as well as some glorious music and singing at Grace Episcopal Church, 108 Lowell Street, 10 o'clock on Sunday, at least for now. In a couple of weeks, it'll be the summer schedule earlier. <laughs> Thank you very much. we want to celebrate so much anymore. But <laughs> thank you. Way back in 1896, the founders of the Manchester Historic Association proposed our Articles of Association, and one clause charged future members with preserving such articles or relics of the Aborigines and early settlers of the country as may be obtained. And we have continued to do so through the intervening 127 years and what we have collected is a vast number of artifacts that lie largely hidden from public view 
at our research center on Amherst Street. Tonight, we honor a person who knows that collection perhaps better than anyone. It is true that for many years, our collection was in disarray. Lots of neat stuff, but no central system to find it or to figure out where it came from. And so it was that one day in 1996, former MHA Executive Director John Mayer put an ad in the New Hampshire Archaeological Society newsletter seeking volunteers to help sort and document our collection. Two young ladies responded. He brought them to a basement coal bin storage room on Amber Street and pointed to a table on which was a pile of rocks and said, could you please try to figure out what these are and where they go? <laughs> well, Jane Potter on the left, hooks it, and Justine Jengris of Alton on the right figured out the rocks were arrowheads, and it took them three days to make sense of the items. Justine has been coming back ever since. Her maiden name is Brown, so everyone knows her as Browning. The work was not new to her, but also was not her first career choice. She earned a degree in sociology with a minor in history at Colby College in Maine. Her first career was in special education. After raising a family, Browning met a University of New Hampshire research archaeologist who got interested in field work back in 1981. She has done field observations and participated in archaeological digs ever since. She did extensive field work surveying the potential impact of the controversial Route 3 and 11 bypass in Laconia. She helped obtain National Registry of Historic Places status for the Charles E. Tilton Mansion in 1982. She did extensive field work in connection with the Russell Colbath House on the Kangamagus Highway for the U.S. Forest Service. Browning has been intimately involved with the SCRAP program, the State Cooperative Regional Archaeology Plan, and in 1984 was honored with the very first Avocational Archaeologist of the Year Award. She also served 10 years on the Tilton Conservation Committee and two years as president of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society. Brownie obviously is not afraid to get her hands dirty. She has literally put in her time in the trenches. In fact, while working on a potential highway expansion along the Connecticut River back in 2002, she even made a few new friends. <laughs> Since 1996, Brownie has volunteered countless hours for the Manchester Historic Association, creating finding guides and databases. She worked alongside Jane Potter for many years until Jane's death in 2014. In the old days, everything was typewritten couldn't easily be searched. Brownie admits that she resisted word processors at first, but quickly came to appreciate their value. When computers came along, she dove headfirst into the world of spreadsheets. You might wonder why we need such extensive databasing or spreadsheeting at the MHA Research Center. Well, for starters, we are the custodians of more than 70 private collections of archaeological objects, which arrive in various states of organization. For example, the Edwin P. Richardson collection of rocks, spearheads, and pottery was collected by one of the NHA founders and contains more than 300 individual items. Then there are hundreds of artifacts from the Harlan A. Marshall collection. Marshall was a former curator of the NHA. Some of you will remember the excavation of Governor Frederick Smith's residence, the Willows, in 1969 on North Elm Street. The site overlooking the Merrimack River became the high rise for the Hampshire Insurance Company, and today is one of the Brady Sullivan properties. But back then, at that site, professional archaeologist Howard Sargent collected more than 2,200 items, from soil samples to arrowheads to Native American flaking tools. Perhaps the granddaddy of our archive is the Clyde Franklin Berry collection, which consists of more than 4,000 items from all over the state. Our Native American collection is comprised of another estimated 15,000 items, all of which require accession numbers and documentation. One MHA insider says this about Ronnie's work. She figured out a way to catalog thousands of items and make the info available to researchers, making sense of the 12,000 years of Manchester archaeological history that was only hinted at previously. Remember earlier tonight when we were asking you to open your wallets and we mentioned acid-free boxes? This is what they look like. Perhaps now you understand why we need so many of them. Back in 2006, this organization presented its President's Award to Browning. She has continued to put in volunteer hours, working quietly and efficiently in the archives at Amherst Street. The Manchester Historic Association is deeply grateful for her years of dedication and behind-the-scenes organizational skills. Tonight, we are pleased to present this Lifetime Achievement Award to Justine Browning Jenkins.
Well, everybody knows that if I start talking, it's hard to shut me up. <laughs> so, so quite honestly, it, it really has been uh, a privilege uh, to work with Manchester's artifacts from the indigenous people. Uh, you're dealing with thousands of years of occupancy here before the mills came. And some of the early collectors even noted that this particular artifact was found uh, where they're building the Jefferson Mill. We do have uh, artifacts, remarkably, that came and were collected uh, in the 19th century. And then we have more and more because as we took better care of the collections, word got out and other collections were deposited, donated for safekeeping. Uh, at the time, this time, we, we literally had thousands of uh, artifacts from indigenous people. And they're now marked and cataloged and they are not all in the computer, and that's what I'm working on now. So I thank you, and I thank you for recognizing my dear friend Jane, who passed ahead of me. Um, I wish more people were interested in what I do, because right now, I'm the only one working on these collections. Be that as it may, they were in good shape, and uh, I hope you visit the mill yard and get a sampling of what we have many more of, I guess, in the drawers that Ed showed you in the photographs. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the formal presentation tonight. We invite you to all join us back in Davidson Hall for dessert and coffee. Um, those of you who made pledges tonight, we ask you to redeem those out of the front table just before you go. And the 30 of you who are eligible for the gift bags, make sure you pick those up and your bottles of wine to go in. Thank you all once again for supporting the Manchester Historic Society. But before we go, we really do owe a great deal of thanks to our own Ed Bruder who is a technological whiz, um, whose command of all things history and technology is absolutely superb. So, Ed, we couldn't do this without you. Thank you.